Hi there. In this video, we want to talk about this paper, Deep Learning in a Spiking Neural Network. And I will not implement any code in this video. I'm just uh, trying to introduce a new uh, concept in deep learning. And this paper is a little old, but there are lots of new research papers coming in the domain of a spiking neural network. And I just want to introduce a spiking neural network and after that a library that you can use it for converting a uh, conventional deep learning. I mean, using the cross library or torch library and then convert it to a spiking neural network. And um, I, I will explain what is the usefulness of that. So a spiking neural network is the neural network that is more similar to biological neural network. Um, what we have so far in deep learning is a little far from the biological network in some aspects. The first thing is, uh, for example, we have a continuous signal coming to the system and we can take a derivative of them. If, even if it is discrete, we can take a derivative. But in a spiking neural network, like in biological system, uh, in brain, we suppose that we have some spikes like in uh, Dirac function. So uh, taking the deriv derivative of these and, and doing the back propagation for training the system is uh, not feasible for a spiking neural network. I will walk through this paper. This paper, as I said, this is a little old, but this paper has a good background about different approach that in 2019, people were working on the uh, spiking neural network. And uh, let's read. So it said that it, in recent years, deep learning has revolutionized the field of machine learning for computer vision in particular. In this approach, a deep learning multi-layer artificial neural network is trained in a supervised manner using backpropagation. Vast amount of label training example are required, but the resulting classification accuracy, accuracy is truly impressive. Sometimes outperform humans. Neurons in an artificial neural network are characterized by a single a static continuous value activation. Yet biological neurons use discrete spike to uh, compute and transmit information and the spike times in addition to the spike rates matter. So this is one of the facts I uh, try to mention. So in uh, deep learning, we had some neurons and we have input coming to the neurons, uh, to different neurons. And the output of the, each neurons is going to the next layer and we get some output. But in a spiking neural network, so we have a spike coming to the system. It is like action potential coming to the neuron. That action potential, or we can call a spike, it's um, coming through a time, like we have this spike, we have another spike, maybe we have another spike in, in that shape. And most of them can be simulated by a Dirac function. We, we are not interested in the shape of them. So we can say, uh, so this is by coming here and in the T time, maybe this is a T time, we get the next spike and maybe in another T2 time, this is T1 and this is T2, we get another spike. And um, this is by coming to this cell, let's change the color. It will active this neuron. And uh, there are some times like after we get one spike to one neuron, if another spike arrive, it can increase the weights uh, of this neuron. And this is like a rest time of that neuron. So it, if it comes faster, so it can boost the weight of this neuron, but um, if they are in a same phase, but if they are in different phase, they can have like attenuation. So the time between the spikes is, is one of the features that we can encode some of the uh, features in the time. The advantage of encoding features in times through the spikes is that we can have less computation. So the power consumption can be decreased because with a fewer layer, we can have more complexity. In biological neural network, we have like uh, one spike coming to this neuron. So it can 
change the potential of the neuron like this. So if we have two spikes, maybe this amplitude is, I mean, the weight of the neuron is, uh, can, can increase. And there are also some saturation that uh, the weights cannot go beyond the limit. And also there is a refractory period. So it means that if two spikes coming in a specific time that uh, one of the spikes uh, come in a refractory period, it doesn't affect. So it means that we just ignore that spikes because it's come in a specific time that uh, the neuron was in the refractory period. So a spiking neural network have the interesting property that output spike trends can be made sparse in time. An advantage of this in biological networks that spike events consume energy and that using few spikes which have high information content reduce energy consumption as I explained. And another important part is this part. So a spike turn in a, a network uh, of a spiking neurons are propagated through synaptic connection as I showed here. So through the uh, synaptic connection, they are synaptic terminals. A synapse can be either excitatory. So as I said, these spikes come to the neuron and the next spike can be excitatory if the time fit the condition. And uh, also it can come in inhibitory like this one. So we have a spike and common inhibitory. I mean, this is just an example. Maybe that's not the correct case. But neuroscientists have identified many variants of the learning rule that falls under the umbrella term spike timing dependent plasticity. It is a key feature that weight, synaptic efficiency, connecting a pre and post synaptic neuron is adjusted according to the relative spike timing within an interval or roughly tens of milliseconds in length. And uh, this is a uh, very famous STDP, the spike timing dependent plasticity uh, is very important for training the uh, spiking neural network. And uh, if a presynaptic neuron fires briefly about 10 milliseconds before the postsynaptic neuron, so we have two neurons like this one and this one, and this is the pre and this is the post. So it said, if this neuron is fire before this one, so we have a fire coming from that neuron. So it means uh, the, the neuron here should be uh, a strength. The connection should be a strength because this is spiked uh, before this one is spiked. And uh, if the presynaptic neuron fires briefly after the postsynaptic, so this is, uh, fired and uh, after a little, about 10 milliseconds later, this will be fired. So this neuron will be in the, as I, as I showed you here, this would be in the refractory period. So it will not get any, uh, uh, any weights and weight is weakened. In backpropagation, we have this formula, but uh, in a spiking neuron network, we have this uh, direct function. So we cannot uh, take derivative of them. This is the first problem. The second problem is that the weight transport problem. So what is the weight transport problem is that when we do back propagation, it means that uh, we have information from the all previous weights. Uh, so we have a history of all previous uh, weights. In the training of the neural network, we know uh, the weights, we know the architecture, we know the all the ways that we will see during the training. So this is called weight transport. But in biological neuron, in reality, when, um, when a neuron is connecting to another neuron, uh, is there any information is passing through the next neuron that say the weight of the previous neuron is what? So we don't have any information of, of those uh, neurons. And uh, the weight transport problem uh, saying that expression, this expression here, uh, is using the fit forward weight in the feedback fashion. This means that matching symmetric feedback weight must exist and project accurately to the correct norm, point to point feedback. So uh, if you searched about the weight transport problem, uh, you, you will see some papers that they could define a backpropagation algorithm by solving the wave transport. Or there are some papers just talking about backpropagation without wave, wave transport problem or stuff like that. So in this table, they are comparing that like using the 
uh, spiking neural network using deep spiking neural network using spiking and CNN. Uh, what is the performance on like memes and CIFAR data sets? So they are really good accuracy in those data. And as I said, the good things about these neural network is that they can be implemented on FPGAs and uh, they can consume less power and uh, can give at least same accuracy. So what I'm gonna show you is a library, it's called Nengo. So I like to bring this example, optimizing a spiking neural network. Uh, also there is a cool app if you uh, like to. And just wanna show you that this is so simple, it's like cross that you can implement a spiking neural network. And that is very interesting to have this kind of library. So uh, first we get the data, using the cross function, it's not nothing to do with uh, Nengo and Nengo deep learning. So we get the data and it said, now we build the convolutional neural network. We create a, a network using the cross. You can see like this line, we are creating a class convolutional layer, stuff like that, but we wrap it inside the Nengo layer. So it means that uh, for each layer, we are converting them to the spiking neural network layer. And the output is here, but we can put a probe. Uh, he, oh, it is also mentioned here that probe, it can be used as a, like we have probe on some part of the neuron to see uh, the output or like seeing accumulating a spike. So as I said, we have uh, excitatory neurons. So maybe that output neurons is uh, excitatory from different previous neurons and can create the desired output. So uh, there is a simulator and we have a mini batch. We pass the network after it's created. This is the network that we created. We have a training image, very similar to what we do in the cross. So we can define the metrics, categorical cross accuracy. We can compile, we can evaluate and start the training, like apply the feet and using the RMS prop optimization and the loss of categorical cross entropy. Uh, we get the output from the logits. That's it. So this is just for training. After we train, if we show the output layer, the, the one that we put the prop on it. So we have like 10 outputs. If you see the networks again, we had 10 different outputs and we put the prop on the output. And if we want to plot them, we can see each neuron and their excitatory. If we input this image to the system after passing through, through those convolution, the spiking neural network showing that the class number, the excitatory is going the, up to probability one. So it's showing that we can get the good classification. It is much more efficient for implementing on the FPGA. So that's why they have some implementation like, so we can, I, I guess we can have Nengo for FPGA example. So Nengo FPGA, if you, if you see, you will see that we have Nengo FPGA. So I haven't worked with those example, but they are like converting from a standard Nengo to the FPGA. So FPGA creating a, a bunch of neurons here and connecting them and create a neural network on FPGA using the spiking neural network. And yeah, it is uh, lots of work to do on this area. I, as I said, I'm not expertise in this, but that was interesting for me. And I thought that it would be interesting for you too. Write a comment if you have any other links, if you have any other good paper on this field uh, or any other implementation that maybe we uh, move forward on some of these topics more deeply. Thank you and have fun.